Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to the Islam Channel podcast. This is the podcast where we invite the deepest Muslim thinkers to get their take on various topics that matter to you. Now, if you want to listen to this podcast, you can find it on all of our podcast streaming platforms, as well as our website and the app. So go ahead and make sure you subscribe and follow, and I'll see you on the other side of this intro. So today I have with me Iqbal Naseem, uh, educator, speaker, writer, uh, the head of the Transform My Prayer uh, online course. How are you doing Iqbal? Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Good. Alhamdulillah. It's good to have you here. Seems like we're matching shirts today. That's right. That's right. I'm not sure what happened there, to be honest. But I've got <laughs> this jacket on, so hopefully uh, people will be able to distinguish us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you look like the smarter one. I'm just here to <laughs> listen and learn. So today we're going to dive into the life of Iqbal Nassim. Iqbal, you have gone on record to show various stages of your life, uh, various things that you've done. And uh, I want to kind of reel back and go back to the beginning, inshallah. And this is where I want to start the podcast. How was Iqbal Nassim as a child? Hmm. So uh, hopefully I'm going to be uh, accurate in my uh, description. But I think the first two words that come to mind are hardworking and mischievous. <laughs> so both of those, uh, both of those two, I think. So definitely, usually those two do come together in, really? in, in okay. people's childhood. You, you hear that when the when when the, when the kid is uh, very very good at school, he starts messing around, and yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I often, um, yeah, that's the thing. So there was definitely, you know, at home and at school, like there was definitely a kind of an environment or a culture of hard work, academic excellence, and all the rest of it. So. Uh, unfortunately, I'm one of those, uh, you know, kids who got like straight A stars and GCSE, straight A's and A level, you know, never dropped a grade, all of that kind of stuff. So that was uh, that was me from that perspective, and uh, did a lot of, you know, some Arabic and Islamic studies and these kinds of things also from an early age. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, like I don't know, you know, the uh, had that sort of devilish side within me, I suppose, where uh, yeah, like just uh, just when you'd see opportunities to just mess around, you know, cause uh, cause problems of different so- sorts. Then so that's the influence of growing up was it in South London you grew up? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, mostly in South London. Exactly. Yeah, mostly it South must London. have been the influence over there. Perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Okay, and uh, where, where do you think that came from? That kind of. Not the mischievous side, <laughs> but the hardworking yeah, side. God not knows dro- about not that dro- one. Yeah. <laughs> not yeah, dropping but, grades. Was, 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 there, was there kind of a standard in the home? Uh, they, were your parents quite strict on that? Yeah, so I'm the oldest of three siblings. And uh, certainly my, uh, yeah, my, my father definitely had, you know, I mean, both my parents, to be honest, although they had very, very different, their own backgrounds are very, very different from an educational uh, perspective. Uh, but yeah, both had this um, emphasis on just you know, uh, achieving, doing one's best. I suppose many like South Asian, you know, immigrant kind of parents and families, like that's been the culture uh, in, in our families. Um, and yeah, it was just this emphasis on, you know, doing doing really, really well, like from a young age, uh, this idea of, you know, getting into Oxbridge, um, uh, you know, sort of getting a, a good job, well-paid job, blah, blah, blah. All of these kinds of things were, were kind of key messages I heard from, uh, from my father, especially. And then from my mom, there was a, there was an emphasis on that but there was also an emphasis on like wider skills development as well public speaking communication these kinds of things organizing things leading things from a young age um yeah and also on like uh, you know from a young age starting to learn arabic etc etc okay and was there um was islam very present in the household growing up yeah yeah i would say definitely so um yeah like i can you know there, there wasn't so much a time when i remember that not being the case my mom actually uh, uh, was a, a, a convert. She became Muslim okay. uh, upon uh, marrying my father. So, uh, and as is the case oftentimes with converts, they're the ones who actually become more interested, uh, more keen to understand what exactly is going on. And and I suppose she had the influence of raising mm-hmm. raising the standard, if you like. Um, and yeah, that you know, she was just keen for us to become knowledgeable um, and influential in a positive way as well. So I can remember things that she would say to me even from a young age that perhaps parts of what I'm trying to do now feel like they just echo those intentions. What would you say those parts were? Uh, the parts that I'm doing now or what she said? What she said oh, and where. Yeah, like she would always now. just give me this idea of, you know, like, you know, the, you know, the one day you're going to, you know, have this, um, uh, have a big impact, have a big influence uh, on people's lives, uh, help people, you know, with regards to the dean, et cetera. So that's something that she was really keen on. 
uh, from a young age that we should have that positive influence, that we should be doers, organizers, mm. leaders, um, not not sort of passive, basically, you know, to, to actually to do stuff and add value. So that was something definitely that it would come from her from a, from, a, from a young age, for sure. So I think, you know, I hope that she's... Uh, I hope she's happy with the progress I'm making. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm obviously, sure. her her supp- I often think that her uh, supplications and her support are, uh, you know, certainly a big factor behind anything that I might be doing that might be of value. I never knew that your mother was a convert to Islam. Mm. Did you feel like there was any difference between you and your friends who are born, uh, who had parents who were born uh, born Muslims? Um, did did you did you notice that there was a, a difference in your practice of Islam or your your outlook on on, on how Islam uh, impacts your everyday life? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, certainly from an early age, I found myself being in a situation where I was, uh, as I said earlier, like you know, I used to do things, for example, like, uh, and this is all her kind of influence, um, but I used to organise. For example, you know, uh, football on a weekly basis for Muslim guys, right? From the, literally from the age of like 10, 11, right. for about 10 years, and so hundreds of uh, kids like over the years would come through that. And the the format simply was football, obviously, <laughs> two halves, uh, as is traditional. Maybe not forty five minutes, you know, yeah. but some sort of two halves. But in the minute, there, in the in, in between, sorry, there would be some uh, some talk, some reminder, something okay. to encourage them. And lots of them, you know, even today, when I, I sometimes I bump into them, they'll actually cite that they'll miss those days, <laughs> and they'll say that you know that was a big influence for them, something like that. So, it's just um, yeah, like th- things uh, things you know th- things like that, basically. So I, I didn't. So I always found myself from an early age, like being in a position where I was doing things like that, hosting circles in my house, sometimes yeah. even in the masjid for, for, for kids and what have you. Um, we did a, a, a newsletter, actually, a two-sided A4 newsletter that, um, called An-Nur. It was an An-Nur newsletter for Muslim youth. And actually, it was like a weekly thing, came out every Friday. I think we got to edition 1000 something something wow. at some stage. Or was that organized by just yourself or the local masjid? No, no, it was literally at the home. Like oh, my wow. mom's idea, wow. right, we're going to do this. And again, that was her way of getting me to think about, okay, what am I going to put together? How are we going to format this thing? Learn how to you know, do those basic yeah. kind of things. Um, literally, we would print it out and then she would often take me on a weekly... Uh, drive to on a Thursday evening to get it dropped off at local mosques <laughs> and actually became really really popular at that time uh, you know not to I mean I'm a 38 now so it was quite a while, a while <laughs> back uh, did I just maybe reveal too much <laughs> well, he's, he's that old he looks so young that's what everyone's <laughs> thinking um, yeah no but at that time the, and then at some stage in that in that journey we sort of uh, you know we discovered the PDF right yeah. and so we basically became a PDF and actually then we had a bit of a mailing list okay. you know, probably broke lots of GDPR rules but uh, <laughs> they didn't exist at the time yeah, so like you know, th- so in answer to your original question, I found myself in a position where I was sort of h- felt the pressure to learn to know and to convey, mm. but I didn't necessarily put that in the context of, oh, my mum's a convert and sure. other people's, got, you know, I didn't process it in that particular way. Yeah, but way in hindsight, you could maybe. Yeah, maybe. That. I mean, certainly just her keenness, but sometimes you know, I think she had an extra kind of may Allah bless her. You know, she had an extra mm. kind of keenness in the sense that it wasn't just about okay being, being steadfast and practicing but just yeah. from an early age there was just this idea that uh no no my my son my children uh are going to be people of influence not just yeah. you know just so there's and i often talk about that in that way nowadays to people i say look there's one thing is about going on the straight path yourself mm. there's another thing which is facilitating the straight path for others yeah. and that's something which i think you know maybe the broader lesson here just from a parenting perspective is actually be ambitious on behalf of your children yeah. you know from an early age and you know in, in, and, and maybe even to con- to convey that and to give that confidence, I suppose, because certainly one thing I think she helped me gain from an early age was confidence, you know, yeah. in to, to, to do things, pursue things. Okay. And so you must have had uh, non-Muslim family members as well then. Yeah. Um, did growing up, knowing that you had non-Muslim family members, does that now impact the way that you see how uh, you need to maybe represent Islam? Because... Uh, I understand the big thing for you is to make sure that Islam can be understood within its context mm. of being here in in Britain, in the US, in the West, mm. where maybe it seems to be foreign, but you want through the different efforts that you're going to, that you're doing now, which we mm. will go into later, sure. that you want to make it something which is accessible and it's within this context. Do you think having that kind of background of non-Muslim family maybe influence some of this? To a certain degree. I mean, my mom is, you know, she's of Indian origin and so okay. is my dad. So from a cultural perspective, like very similar. 
So if yeah. she was obviously like, let's say, um, you know, a, an English or a white English, or, yeah. or, you know, convert, that would have been yeah. a different sure. thing, perhaps. And then what you're mentioning would have been, you know, I probably should have said that earlier, but, you know, what you're mentioning perhaps would have been more, more the case. I think that my, uh, my keenness to make sure that, uh, or just to kind of, in the work that I do, but also to convey to, uh, to others um, this kind of responsibility or this burden of bearing witness and being believers in a way that is appropriate for the cultural context mm. is something which um, I don't know. I think just occurred to me over the over the course of time, just with various bits of learning and and influences, you know, on on my life, and and of course it's reflective of, you know, we know that it's reflective of the Quranic narrative, and I think this is, and I think language is such a big part of all of this, uh, you know, through obviously through the work I do in in the in the area of salah, there's a lot of focus on this, the issue of language and how we are understanding what we're saying and conveying what we um, yeah conveying things in a meaningful way but I think the issue is for us as believers we have this thing you know they talk it in, talk about it in psychology as like cognitive dissonance right where you're yeah. effectively to put it in simple terms hopefully I'm not misrepresenting like you know sort of uh, some serious psycho psychological literature here but basically you know you're it's like a split identity kind of thing yeah so there's almost like the Muslim part of us and then there's the other part of us um, and and when we when we do the Muslim part of us we almost we reason, we think, we communicate, we learn through a different, almost through a whole different lens, basically, and in a way that's different to how we do, for example, learn our subjects at school and engage with each other yeah. and speak with each other and whatever. And so, a lot of people will be familiar with this kind of idea and have experienced this idea of almost love leading some sort of double life, mm. almost. And I think that what we need to do is to be able to understand and articulate everything that we actually believe and the way we see the world uh, in obviously in English speaking um, community society in plain English, you know? Yeah. And I think that's just critically important. So I'm, a, I, I'm someone who has a, a, a problem with transliterated terms. Okay. You know? Meaning when we, when, we, uh, when we involve transliterated terms in our normal narrative and our normal speak, oftentimes we don't realize the extent to which the meaning of those things is lost on us and lost on the other person. So mm. a classic example uh, is that when we say with each other, to each other, uh, inshallah, mashallah, jazakallahu khayran, etc. Yeah. A lot of the times, the way we've become accustomed to saying these things, we've actually lost the sense of what it, we, what it is that we're saying. Yeah. So you'll hear people saying inshallah when they're talking about some past event, even, you know, just in a <laughs> random context, right? Where it's not even appropriate. And they don't appreciate that what they're saying is, you know, if God wills or God willing yeah. or what have you, or jazakallahu khayran, mm. which in the minds of people have just become thank you. Thank you, yeah. Right? So then you'll see, you know, someone I was joking with a friend the other day, you know, he, he sent me a message, Jazakallah so much. <laughs> and I'm like, so what did you mean by that? Yeah, I'll pick him up on it, yeah? So then he was like, did you mean thank you so much or did you mean may Allah reward you so much? What did you actually intend when yeah. you said it? So yeah. things are lost in translation mm -hmm. or not in translation, I suppose. So, you know, I think that's a really important thing. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا رَسُولًا إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ Never did we send a messenger except by the tongue, literally, of their people, uh, the language of their people, but language speaks to culture, speaks to social capital, uh, in the manner of engagement. And we need to, uh, even though many of us have come from backgrounds and families which are, you know, uh, recent immigrant families and communities in the societies in which we're in. And even though there may be hostility towards us for that fact, we need to change the paradigm of the conversation. Yeah. That it's not about brown, if, like, you know, if we're seen through the lens of being other and foreign and brown and X, Y, Z, of course, you know, like people who have their prejudices, but we should approach peop these people in, who live in and amongst the, around us as our people, mm. you know? We're here to bring something bigger, you know, we've got a bigger message, right, than simply talking about, you know, something, you know, just uh, put it, putting it in the context of rights and identity politics. But we have a universal yeah. value proposition, which is submission to God, Islam, and that's what we need to go and convey, and that's our duty. I was actually speaking to somebody not too long ago about this, where he was sort of saying he was talking about it in the in the in the context of sort of media, where, where Islam channel is thinking, you know, how can we take media forward? Mm. How can the da'wah sort of move forward when it comes to it, through the medium of media? Mm. And he was speaking about you know doing documentaries mm. on various issues that British people face mm. um, and how. Islam has certain solutions to this, mm. and uh, off the back of that, I I asked him like why 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 is it that you know Muslims don't think that these problems are their problems when it's to do with things like alcohol mm. alcoholism homelessness yes. 
um, you know, what, uh, poverty, et cetera, mm. et cetera. Why do we not think that's our problem? Mm. Mm. And I said, I think it's because when we think of the word community, the first thing that comes to our, in our minds, the naturally the first things that come in your mind is going to be people who look like you. Mm. Uh, and so when I asked him, you know, what's the first thing that comes to your head when I say community, he says, you know, maybe like a brown uncle, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, in the masjid, mm. something like that. Mm. And I said, well, why do we not think when we say community, why do we not think of the people who are around us, mm. our local, mm. where we actually live, mm. which majority of them are not actually Muslim mm. in many parts of the UK. Mm. Mm. Um, and if, and if we do begin to think like that, then we begin to see them, like you said, as our people, my mm. people. Mm. And we begin to understand that their problems are our problems and mm. our problems are their problems. Mm. And so it isn't about us just going out and uh, really only putting resources to fix the issues that affect us in particular as Muslims, mm. although that's important. But we need to be thinking on a wider level on how do we fix the problems of the community as a whole, mm. which will actually elevate everybody together and will bring people closer to a stage where they can now think God consciously. They mm. can now start considering whether there are other ways of living that are going to be more conducive to keeping this new norm that we have of fixing our issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I Just uh, as you were speaking, uh, the verse came to mind, uh, the last verse of Surah at tawbah لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ that certainly a messenger has come to you from amongst yourselves. And this idea of from amongst yourselves is emphasized in different yeah. places in the Quran. You know why, right? We have to think about that. The idea of that there's, he's one of you, belonging, etc. And that, uh, and then Allah says, Azizun alayhi ma anittum. Which means that uh, the things that trouble you weigh heavily on him. Harisun alaykum. He's very concerned for you. Bil mu'minina raufur rahim. He's tender, merciful towards the believers. So what does that indicate? That the first part is about you, the people. So what affects you, the people? You know, all of you, the community weighs heavily upon him. Uh, and uh, and he has a concern for all of you. So it's exactly just reflective yeah. of what you've said. Yeah, subhanAllah. But I think we, we went uh, away from your life story. Yes, we'll yes. come back to it, inshallah, now. So uh, after being, mashallah, a studious student, you ended up in... Cambridge mm. uh, so uh, I mean I can guess how that came about you were just kind of getting those uh, A stars and uh, it was natural to say well I'll just go for Oxbridge and you got into Cambridge what was the story behind it yeah I mean so so you know so I, I remember I applied for I only applied for three universities because basically if I didn't get into the universities then I was going to maybe take a gap year or something okay. so I applied for Cambridge LSE and UCL alhamdulillah I had offers from all of them um, but the, the yeah like Cambridge is obviously nerve-wracking it's a different story because it's not just about your grades you have to basically perform in this interview and you know the oxbridge interview is notoriously uh, a bit yeah. of a tough thing right so uh, anyway alhamdulillah somehow i managed to uh, convince them that i knew something about economics which is what i was uh, applied for um although yeah when i was there my experience i mean my general experience at university was alhamdulillah very positive and beneficial but i ha i hated the economics I actually hated it <laughs> completely hated it um it's funny because at that time i i you know I remember thinking there wasn't a particular subject, certainly a school subject that I felt really like passionate about. Okay. Um, at GCSE, I did loads of languages, tons of languages. And that was something I was interested in. But unfortunately, in my mind, I was thinking, you know, we were in that mode of thinking. I was certainly in the mode of thinking of, you know, well, What's going to pay the big uh, bucks? Yeah. No, well, not necessarily even the big bucks. Like, you know, it just felt like so distant, you know, if I was going to yeah, do language, yeah. like, okay, it's not even about big bucks, it's about any bucks. What would I even do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, at GCSE, I did both, um, you know, well, I did Arabic, actually, uh, Urdu, yeah. I did French, Italian, I did classical Greek, Latin. Wow. Yeah. So classics as well as <laughs> modern languages. Um, and then obviously all the usual stuff. Anyway, so that's something which naturally I was like language, linguistics, whatever I was okay. certainly interested in. But anyway. It kind of like by a process of elimination ended up with economics, which I did not did enjoy at A-level, but I hated university, became too technical, too theoretical, just too removed from real yeah. sort of stuff. So I'm not someone who's very good with, I suppose, things that are just too far removed from any kind of reality, yeah. if you like. So what saved me uh, in that regard was that in the third year, there's a, there was the ability to move to management studies at the business school in Cambridge University. Uh, so I switched to that for the third year and graduated with that. Alhamdulillah, I did well in that in that year. And that I really, really enjoyed because it was yeah. much more hands-on. There was theory, but it was in the context of like real world stuff, mm. organizational management, leadership, blah, 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 blah. So I really, um, that I definitely enjoyed a lot. And was was the Islamic Society established uh, then? Were you involved in it? Yeah, yeah, I was. I was actually. So it was quite funny because, um, so uh, yeah, so started the first term, and then I'm not sure what the backstory was, but basically the treasurer of the Islamic Society 
just abandoned his position. Mm -hmm. And then, so within two months, actually, of literally joining the university, uh, I was asked uh, as to whether I wanted to become the treasurer. Because, of course, the only qualification you need to become a treasurer is to be studying economics. <laughs> so he's the first guy, right? So obviously, but, but Same thing happened in, in, I think it happens in every university right, when it comes exactly. to the ISOC. Same thing after us. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're studying business and finance, economics, yeah, you yeah. can be treasurer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, Hamda, I think I did a reasonable, I think I did a reasonable job. Um, but uh, yeah, so that, so literally first year treasurer, second year vice president, third year president. Okay, so Hamda, that's what so was you're my, very involved then. I was very involved. Yeah, so it was, it was definitely, it was pretty much my main thing that I was doing at okay. university, really outside of the uh, outside of the yes, surviving economics. Yeah, there's a stereotype that comes with going to Oxford and Cambridge, which is sort of only for posh people, and mm, not many right. uh, of us folk, brown lot, Muslims, <laughs> etc., yeah. are, are, are there. Uh, did you did you find that challenging? No, I mean, well, it's not that it's not challenging. It's, uh, it's not even true. That's Great. the thing, right? So actually you had people from all walks of life. There was actually very, at the time that I was there, you know, sometimes we would afterwards jokingly refer to it as the, you know, the golden age of Islam in the Cambridge University <laughs> because uh, it was um, it was apparently, I mean, I, I only learned this later. When I was there, 2002 to 2005, um, it was after actually, you know, many years of apparently very sectarian kind of um, situation. In, so you had lots of different groups uh, represented very strongly and, and um yeah, let's just say very strongly, right, at, at the university scene. Uh, and subsequently also a little bit, perhaps, I don't know, this is what I understood. But at the time, I felt it was really, really, really nice atmosphere because there wasn't, you know, be, there genuinely felt like we were in, a, in an environment where the interest and the conversation was just about how can we become more faithful? How can we be more steadfast? You know, how can we uh, just be Muslim, basically, without all of the particulars and the baggage of this or that? you know, path or, or school or whatever, right? Or, yeah. or, and, and all these kinds of things. So I think it was nice. I think it was a kind of unifying uh, atmosphere. Lots of people, you know, yeah. So it was a nice community of, uh, and lots of people, you know, I think they found their, they found their faith at that time, which often happens at university, but a, a kind of faith that I think wasn't the kind which people have to recover from later, if you want to okay. say. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so it was something which it was, that, was, that was nice. And definitely we were very fortunate to have uh, you know, Abdul Hakim Murad, who's obviously was really his lecturer at the university. Yep. Uh, since then, you know, mashallah, has done amazing stuff at, in Cambridge, uh, you know, behind the Cambridge Mosque, which if anyone's yep. been, if you haven't been, you need to go. And if you've been, obviously, you know how what an amazing yeah, project amazing. it is. Yeah, I think it's a reflection of the man's heart in some way, I'm sure. <laughs> and the uh, Cambridge Muslim College, uh, which obviously yes. is another very important and pioneering institution. So, you know, d certainly listening to his Friday sermons there, having that opportunity where, you know, where, well, which was the first time where I really felt, well, certainly in person anyway, that someone was, you know, breaking down these basic concepts, if you like, you know, sabr, shukr, you know, uh, patience and steadfastness, gratitude, iman, you know, faith, belief, conviction, etc. And all of the various things, but just doing it in this really beautiful way, in an inspiring way, a way that, w you know, made you want to um, just learn more. And yeah, and, and yeah. so definitely that was a, a big... Um, a big positive of that whole time for sure that's amazing it sounds like it's the complete opposite of the stereotype in fact that yeah. going there is you you lose your religion or you you'll never be around people like that in fact you seems like you found more grounding in faith in yeah. your experience at cambridge yeah alhamdulillah. Yeah. um and then you went on a journey to start memorizing the quran and uh, yeah so that actually started so i had a very odd kind of um path to memorizing the quran i think you know it's 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 it was relatively unusual in the sense that um, as I mentioned earlier, I studied Arabic from a young age. Yeah. So literally from the age of nine or 10, uh, my mom actually, and this is just another evidence of her kind of proactiveness when it came to this stuff. She, she did something which at the time I think was pretty unheard of, which was that she literally got the local, like, got the local imam to start doing private tuition in our home. Mashallah. So at that time that was quite unusual, yeah. you know, um, it's probably still unusual to be honest, to yeah. a certain degree. Uh, and so uh, he, uh, she, con she convinced him to say, you know, you, you come to our house, I think, I don't know, two, three hours or something every week on a Saturday morning, I think it was. Uh, and again, we literally, that was a 10 year, 10 year thing. So okay. if I'm, uh, if I'm not mistaken, by the time, well, we, obviously we had a focus on Quranic Arabic. He also yeah. assisted in part of that. I did GCSE Arabic and all that stuff. Okay. I think by the time uh, we sort of finished, because when I went to university, obviously we, you know, didn't really continue in the same way. Yeah. I think that I had uh, literally done a grammatical analysis and translation uh, of I think more than half of the Quran, basically. Wow, right? So because what with the process we went through, eventually we started doing this process where basically every week I'd have a section 
and I have to do word by word. Okay, do the i'rab, yeah. meaning the grammatical analysis uh, of each word. You know? <laughs> so singular, plural, ten forms. Yeah, got it back to front. You know, and then uh, and then just attempt a sort of a translation. And then we okay. would look at with him. I could go through it, go through the translation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and look through. So you know, yeah, definitely benefited a lot from that whole process. Anyway, uh, the point being is that before, but it, during that pro, during that time, I hadn't. There wasn't as much of an emphasis on the uh like the hifth of it the sure. memorization yeah yeah and you like you know obviously short saw us 30th jewels etc yeah. um but then i think yeah in that first year of university i think it just dawned upon me and there probably would have been some stories maybe maybe just to uh, you know influencing me in that way well, i just thought to myself like like i should do this really like i yeah. i should do this you know I've, I've not that i had loads of time necessarily but i thought okay i'm at university certainly i've got more time now than i probably will have later i've yeah. got the language and in a way, if I didn't have the language, I wouldn't have started. Right. Because actually for me, I was, you know, in a way I was relying on the fact that I understood what I was uh, trying to memorize to help me memorize it. Sure, sure, you know? sure. So yes, there is this kind of miraculous sort of phenomenon that goes on where lots of young kids, obviously without understanding anything, are, you know, you know, re- yep. memorizing the, the entire Quran. Um, but yeah, my, my journey was almost in reverse, which I think uh, was certainly it's beneficial. Probably, yeah, yeah. I, I would say it's probably the the better method of of it being done. Yeah. Not to say that the method is wrong, but this seems to be better in the sense yeah. that you're actually engaging with what you're right, memorizing, exactly. and yeah. and the fact that you're building language up from a younger age, yes. it, it obviously sticks with you rather yeah. than learning it in, in a later age. That's and right. You find that a lot of uh, kids who do memorize the Quran, you know, between that usual, I think it's usually between that ten and fifteen years exactly. old yeah. uh, time, uh, later they try to pick up Arabic in mm. their sort of 20s. It's difficult. And, 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 and it is mm. difficult, yeah, it's definitely difficult. Whereas yeah. the other way around, it seems like you are, as you are memorizing, you are at least able to understand yeah. what yeah. you are memorizing. Yeah, no, exactly. So I think, you know, so oftentimes parents ask me, you know, what I would suggest in terms of like kids and what to do with kids, etc. And I certainly don't discourage memorization. Yeah. But I always say to people, like I always, everything's a trade-off. Mm. So I get, I basically, okay, so what's the trade-off here? If you're going to get your kids to memorize the Quran, fine, but then, is there a trade-off in the time that they're going to spend doing that in terms of their understanding um, language, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. If there's a plan for that, fine, right? And you manage all of it, you know, obviously the simultaneous thing is, is best. But if it literally is a choice between one or the other, yeah. in the long run, the, la- the language and the understanding is going to be key. Because for me, alhamdulillah, you know, since then, that's been a big opener for me in, in I suppose, the ability to, to read, to access classical text, yeah. right, to do, to do sort of analysis and thinking uh, independently, as well as consult, obviously, you know, scholars and understand that when people are talking about things like the, the sort of the parameters within which they're dis- having these discussions, whereas, of course, in, in the other way around, you know, it's, 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 it's either hard or impossible to do that. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did um, the journey then continue? So there's a funny, funny story behind this one, actually. So so whilst I was in Cambridge, then the question was, okay, so how, who's going to test me? Okay. Right? Uh, or as they would say, you know, who's going to do my door, my sabbat, <laughs> right? <laughs> However, right, just just do the, uh, who's going to hear me out to, to, because that's quite a big commitment, obviously, okay. right? So obviously I set aside time, you know, most days to then actually just do the memorization. I typically would take, say, you know, half a page, page at a time. Alhamdulillah, you know, I had a, had a good memory. Uh, I, I mean, I say I had, I, th- I think I might still, still do. do. Well, I don't know. It's funny. I think I don't have good memory for events, to be honest. <laughs> so I'm, hopefully I'm not making up most of what I'm you talking about. You made it here on time. That's the main thing. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, so we we'll do that. And then for, initially I was like just self-testing, maybe with some other students and stuff. And then um, uh, and then eventually managed to arrange, literally, so <laughs> I, spoke, I remember speaking to my mum about it. Uh, arranged for a landline uh, connect, sort of connection in my uh, in my room uh, at, in, within the university kind of campus, right. uh, which needed. A, I can't remember what the details were, but basically you had to sort that out. And then sounds like a lifetime ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was literally, and then uh, and then basically arranged for a teacher uh, a remote remotely. So this is someone who then. You know, we just made inquiries, went and met somebody yeah. from, I think, from a madrasa or not a madrasa, but um, like a Darul Ulum, right? Where obviously this is going on. They were happy to do this like remote kind of thing every so yeah. often. So I can't remember the exact frequency, to be honest, but it was at least once a week. And then, um, yeah, and then he was just, he would just hear me out and listen to me and correct me. And um, and then that would be the process. Although uh, one time what happened, and this is the sort of fu- funny, I mean, it's kind of it's funny in one way, but not so funny in another way. Uh, I was... Um, uh, yeah, I was reciting, I was reciting, and then I got, I got stuck, right? 
and then I was just hoping that I would get the response back, you know. And then uh, in in the distance, like I, I'm pretty sure I heard basically a flushing toilet, <laughs> 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 and I thought, okay, he's just gone off. Like he's just he's just left me there. So I think that was the last time I did it with this guy. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I don't know what happened. He didn't tell me. He didn't tell me pause. Uh, like, just give me a few minutes. No, he just literally went off. And he came back, and then yeah, it was a disaster. Anyway, so that wasn't that wasn't good. But um, yeah, so just you know, managed to get through. And then basically, over the course of three years, two and a half years at university, uh, alhamdulillah, I managed to memorize um, I think about half, basically about fifteen, fifteen juz. Okay. Um, so kept, that was a like you know that's a relative that would be considered to be a relatively slow to medium pace, right? Okay. But obviously, it was fitting in around yeah. other things. Yeah, yeah. But then, and this is what, where I was kind of coming earlier, just bringing the other bits in, but. After graduation, I went to Jordan. Mm -hmm. So I had a job offer to start at um, uh, this investment banking role because I'd been doing these internships in the summer, which was what I was referring to earlier. Um, and then, uh, but I, I told the firm uh, that was uh, that had offered me a job that I want to take some time out before I start full time. Uh, so that involved a bit of negotiation anyway, then got seven months. Okay. So then I took seven months to go to Jordan. And in that seven months, I literally did the rest of it. You wow. Know? So okay. that was quite intensive because that was literally, you know, two two juz a month. Yeah. So one every two weeks. Yeah. Which is basically like, you know, a couple of pages a day roughly, yeah. you know. Yeah. Every weekday at least. Um so that was but but alhamdulillah I had an amazing uh amazing teacher there. Uh, and you went out there by yourself? Yeah, so there's a there's an institute there still running, I think, called Qasid Institute okay. uh, in Jordan. So I looked at different options like uh, you know Syria, Egypt. You know, I mean, everything yeah. was available at that time. Yeah, Obviously, yeah. nowadays things have changed. Um, but I just felt, yeah, that this was a nice setup, professional setup. Sure. I think some American guys had gone back and um, or gone there just to set this up. Uh, yeah, so I did uh, was doing studies at the institute, uh, Arabic, other Islamic studies, and then outside arranged this private kind of. Um, yeah, private sessions with this Quran, um, well, expert, I would say. Yeah. Uh, you basically, you had you know, you could look at, you could take any tafsir volume from his uh, from his shelf, and you would open it, and there was just notes and connections and this and wow. that, and also like he was, you know, mashallah, he's uh, he was pretty encyclopedic in his knowledge. So anyway, he uh, he he you know he helped me out basically with that whole process. So. Alhamdulillah, whilst I was there, I completed it. I remember there was a party, you know, we sacrificed an animal. Mashallah. And they made this amazing, <laughs> amazing Jordanian uh, dish and everything. So we ate and celebrated, alhamdulillah. So that was nice. And then... Uh, you could have done anything in those seven months. I mean, that's key, you know, graduated year before you're going to start work. Yeah, yeah. That's like, you could do anything. Why did you choose to finish off that Quran journey? Yeah, well, I suppose yeah, it's like, uh, isn't that what they say at the beginning of... Uh, at the end of mastermind or in the mastermind i've started so i'll finish you know, <laughs> it's like you know they start the question and yeah. then the time comes i got to finish and i think it was just that like i'd started i knew that basically it's almost because of that because of the fact that i knew that once i get into work you know it's going to be intense because those internships gave me a taste of like the crazy life of right. uh, the financial services industry uh, and so i thought okay yeah like you know sort of a bit of a now or never really and and that was the case because i can't really uh, conceive of the fact that i would have been able to do that otherwise so yeah it was a pretty I was like, I mean, you know, I was I was pretty um, disciplined, really, in that, <laughs> at that time. Like, I had a very hardcore routine. Yeah. Um, for those for those seven months, you know, mostly kept myself to myself. Just studies, studies, and you know, bit bit of this and that here and there. Other students would be going here, then everywhere. Yeah. But I was just like, I was quite. I've got seven months here. I just yeah, need yeah, to do exactly, it. Yeah, exactly. Quite focused. So yeah. I mean, to do the fifteen Jews whilst at Cambridge, I think is quite an achievement, mm -hmm. and uh, they may be people who are at university now listening and thinking, mm. I really do want to memorize Quran, but yeah. you know, at university, especially Cambridge, where you know, you're going to be challenged a lot more. Mm. Um, where do you find the time? What tips could you maybe give them on Quran in, in, while, while studying at university? Yeah. Again, to bring it back to our earlier conversation, certainly from my perspective, I would say, you know, emphasis on the language, mm -hmm. you know, definitely emphasis on the language, emphasis on understanding, having this curiosity about what's in this revelation how do we apply this revelation um and just going on that journey i think certainly would emphasize that over memorization again if there's a trade-off because of the available time if someone has the kind of fluency they're comfortable in their pronunciation and they maybe have you know they're comfortable that they want to go on that journey it's literally just again it's just it's like anything else in life you just gotta it's like priorities and then like time boxing right like yeah i've got this many hours this many commitments you know you you almost have your you need to do your to you have your to do list but you need your stop doing list as well mm, yeah. right I'm not going to do this I, you know I 
think we need to know when to say no uh, to things because lots of opportunities will come and at university uh, you'll get no, there's no shortage of invitations to be <laughs> here in this guy's uh, you know flat or, or apartment or whatever until you know 1 a.m to you know, <laughs> just wasting time or whatever which on occasion of course you know that's part of the that's yeah. part of the whole experience but yeah it's just literally that so because most actually yeah university is tough but for many for I mean, it depends what subject one is studying, of course. You know, there was a joke at uh, Cambridge University, certainly. I don't know if it's the case elsewhere. They're like, if you're studying history, you know, or English or something, the, you know, the guys had like, you know, four hours of lectures a week or something. <laughs> and then the rest of the time just seemed to be off. That's what it looked like. <laughs> so, you know, any historian right, should be doing their hips, basically. But of course, the medics, you know, like completely yeah. like pushed to the hilt, you yeah. know, and, uh, and engineers just, you know, seem to, you know, the, their brains were always, uh, you know, and their minds just always seem to be somewhere else. <laughs> so, you know, obviously it depends. It just depends. But I think a little bit and regular. Yeah, that's that's the key. And again, as we said, understanding over, you know, just uh, rote memorization. OK, Alhamdulillah. And then you came back from Jordan yeah. and got involved in investment banking. Yeah. Uh, so what was that like and how many years did you spend in that field? Yeah, so I had already had some experience, you know, through these internships and uh, started April 2006. So I worked uh, in the field or an area called equity research. Okay. So equity research basically means that you are analyzing, studying companies that are listed on the stock market and then you're making um, investment recommendations, you know, mm -hmm. on those companies. And they it would be split up by sector. So I was in the oil and gas sector. And within the oil and gas sector, I was... A, within um, studying companies that were specifically called oil services companies. So this isn't your BPs and Shells and these kind of companies, but it's the less well-known companies that do all of the work, basically, right. uh, when in terms of like um, uh, what's called seismic exploration, like actually discovering well, where is the oil in the first, the oil and gas in the first place, uh, to like the drilling, you know, companies extraction, yeah. uh, etc. So actually very interesting like uh, work, you know, basically high tech engineering uh, yeah. construction companies doing some of the some of the biggest projects around the world and I had the opportunity to come and visit some of these projects okay. around the world as well um, so 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 it was a very so that's was the role and 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 actually you know many people ask me about this that from my perspective and I did my kind of research at the time from a kind of um, permissibility perspective I was comfortable okay. that with with the work that I was doing so yeah. it wasn't one of these cases that I left this field later because I was uh, worried about the permissibility of the income. Of course, I mean, we're now in a day and age where there's a little bit of grey, frankly, in, in the vast majority of roles and functions. But certainly in this area, you're in equities, you're in a, you're in a field which yeah, has its moral issues, environmentally and otherwise, but fundamentally, I think everyone accepts that it has its place as well, oil and gas and energy and all of these of things, right? Um, and uh, and yeah, so anyway, so 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 that was that. So definitely enjoy it, enjoyed it the most part of it. You know, I was there for five years. April two thousand six, left the industry in June two thousand eleven. So just over five years. Um, learned a lot, and I had a boss, you know, who in the early years really um, put me in the deep end with everything. So I was doing stuff literally in the first few months that you know I know that like peers who were joined in you know similar roles and stuff they were you know just because of the culture and the nature of the team you know just maybe like held back from doing certain things until sure. later on. So that was pretty nerve wracking, you know, some of the things that you had to do, like literally, you know, sit one to one with like uh, senior portfolio managers of big pots of money, <laughs> telling them like your opinion about what company yeah. to invest in or not. And these are people who've got like sometimes a heck of a lot of experience. And then you're just literally turned up, <laughs> you know, just after a few months, you know, talking about what you found out. Um, you know, traveling with the CEOs of FTSE 100 companies right. in their private jets, yeah. right? And then discussing like, you know, the oil and gas industry you know, at the age of 22. I'm like, oh my God, man, this is ridiculous, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, the, the fruit platter on the private jet was nice. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, so I had all of these kinds of experience, you know, and just, so I think from a, just like that whole deep end, like new thing, confidence, blah, blah, blah all of these definitely just felt I learned a lot in that time. But yeah. after a while, I think I just became a bit jaded as we've already discussed, you know, is um, before I went into this field, like almost from a young age, I'd always accompanied whatever I was doing with just other kinds of hopefully valuable community work, yeah. you know, trying to um, convey things to people and to learn myself about the faith and how we can be closer to our Lord, etc. And whilst at the time in the firm itself, or in the various firms uh, that I worked at in that short time, um, we managed to have like really good community you know, of uh, 
I would say mainly brothers, just because it was mainly brothers, like yeah. men, I mean, just a male dominated environment generally, but brothers and sisters in this environment, where again, alhamdulillah, I managed to have the influence alongside others to help people get consistent in their prayers. So yes, you're in this busy environment, but actually there is a space, so let's help each other. And one of the things that, you know, I remember doing at that time, uh, which is, which people has helped people since, uh, is we used to set up, we, we had set up like a calendar invitation you know, basically to invite people. And we basically established congregational times to encourage people to try and come at a certain right. time for Dhuhr prayer, Asr prayer, especially because sure. that was during the day. Um, and just by the fact of the people getting these notifications, you know, and feeling bad to decline them altogether, <laughs> right? That uh, people just started praying before, uh, you know, and whereas yeah. before, you know, because now it felt, okay, I'm in part of a group, there's something here and they're, they're coming together. So it was a very, very good experience in that sense. And I felt that I was able to add value, but because the hours were pretty demanding, it's almost like you didn't have time for anything else really. Yeah. And so I came to a point, you know, especially to the 2009, especially 2010, where I thought to myself, look, what, you know, what, like, what am I doing? You know, like, why am I doing this basically? Mm -hmm. And uh, whilst, as I said, I didn't have any issue with it from a permissibility standpoint, I was just thinking to myself, okay, look, what do I want to be doing with my time, with my life? Mm -hmm. And I used to ask myself that question then, and I ask it now, and I get others to think about it for themselves today now. That look, if you if you had six months left to live, what would you change? Yeah, because you know when you have six months left to live, twelve months left to live, and you know it, and you've got your health and everything else, but you literally assume, okay, that's how much I've got left to live, then it forces a different kind of set of considerations mm. on you about what really matters, what's valuable, um, what do I'm gonna give, what am I gonna give my time to? Yeah, you see, some of us we go through this whole career path. At, we're at university, we're choosing jobs and careers. Again, and this part of that dissonance, I think, that I talked about earlier on. We separate the considerations about what we're going to do in our lives from our overall worldview of our accountability to our Lord, etc. Now, I'm not saying, of course, that any quote unquote normal job, that there's anything necessarily wrong with that. But what I'm saying is, what thought process have we gone through to arrive at the outcome that we think that now this is the best way to use our time in our lives? Like, what mm -hmm. are the considerations there? Because we all know that actually careers become very consuming they become the actual sources of our identity you know so that's why within the first few questions of a conversation with another person when you introduce them is basically like well what do you do yeah yeah what do you do and then yeah. what they do oh i'm a lawyer i'm an accountant i'm xyz that's the basis on which we're defining each yes. other yeah. you know and frankly it's no different even you know amongst amongst muslims amongst believers that's how we, we kind of do it that's the culture so it's a very very dominant thing our entire identity is caught up in the specific worldly pursuit so yeah, I would just say, look, it's in, it's important for us to uh, to think through that carefully. And for me, in my case, I was like, you know, when if my Lord asks me, which he will, uh, and ask all of us, yeah. well, basically, what is it that you were trying to achieve? What did you mm -hmm. do with the time, energy, skills, opportunities I presented to you in the context that I particularly placed you? Then am I going to have a good answer to that? Like, another way to ask that is to, how deep does our Islam run in our decision making? Yep. And so let me translate that. How deep does our submission, our devotion, our commitment to Allah run in our decision making? So for me, I was thinking to myself, okay, like, well, if I, if I put aside my worries and concerns about, finance, about income yep. and taking care of the family and all this stuff, and I just think to myself, okay, what, if I didn't have those worries or concerns at all, how would I spend my time? Would I be yep. still here doing this? Yep. And if the answer is no, then for me that was enough to say well then that means this isn't the best place for me to be okay so if someone if someone says well actually you know if i didn't need the money meaning i had all of the money in the world and i get people to think about this and people should think i think it's a very very powerful thing to think about yeah. if i had all the money right and i didn't need the money how would i use my time what is an ideal life free of that kind of constraint yeah now most people have actually they don't even know the answer to that question is the truth and when you've lost the answer to that question, you don't know what the answer to that question is, you've a kind of a little bit, you're, not only are you probably leading a suboptimal life, you don't even know what optimal looks like, and so you can never transition to it anymore. Yeah, subhanAllah. Whereas I know now, having for myself and gone through with dozens of people over the years who've either asked me just organically or naturally, and now more recently because I'm doing more constructed programs around this, that people have like serious openings, yeah, when they are just put into a space or environment which just allows them to think freely and fearlessly about what's the best use of my time and my life. Yeah. And so um, and so that's the set of considerations that basically led me to abandon what was a, 
uh, a lucrative career and actually abandon what was going to be uh, like I, basically at the time that I left in 2011, I had an arrangement with my then employer that if I'd stayed for another couple of years, I would have basically got a million dollars in guaranteed compensation. Um, like, you know, you know, that just tells you how crazy yeah. investment banks are, right? Like it was literally <laughs> golden handshake and sign the contract. And basically, as long as you stay... What do they call them? Golden, golden handcuffs, right? <laughs> oh, handcuffs, yeah, well, yeah. yeah well, I, alhamdulillah, I've managed to break those. But um, yeah, but basically, yeah, like, you know, you had that guarantee because they wanted to keep me there. Yeah. And, and so it's not that I wasn't successful in what I was doing, because clearly you wouldn't get a, an yeah. offer like that if you didn't know what you were talking about. Um, and it's not that... Um, uh, and neither is it about the whole permissibility type of sure. thing that oh banking is haram. I think banking is haram is a bit too much of a generalization. Sure. It's a bit more nuanced than that. Um, although of course there's many aspects which are highly problematic. Uh, it was just look, what's the best use of my time? Yeah. And so alhamdulillah, you know, I, I I left that, and it was people look at it and they think, God, that must have been a really tough decision. Yeah. But actually, by the time I, I was got to be it, my next question. Actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, by the time I got to it, it was almost the easiest decision in the world mm. because. I was almost like desperate now. I got to a state of desperation of finding a path where I felt like that this is the life I actually want to lead. This yeah. is the fearless path, if you like, and hopefully one which was deeply rooted in a commitment to my Lord, given my circumstances, yeah. the way he's made me and my, you know, my effort basically for, for his sake. So that was it. Do, do you think maybe you were only really able to do that because you were comfortable with the amount of finances that you did have available to yourself. Mm. Because some people who are maybe are in a less uh, less earning, less paying, less earning, what, what's the phrase I would use there? Yeah. Uh, they were in a yeah. job that wasn't earning as much as sure. maybe yeah. you were. Yeah. Um, and then they asked them, themselves that question, like yeah. you said, that quite powerful question. It's yeah. already got me thinking yeah. on what you would do if money was not a constraint. Yeah. Well, the outcome of that would be, yeah, I would be doing xyz yeah but i can't think to that level right now anyway because i don't even have funds available and so i have to keep grinding at what i'm doing sure. in order to get to that stage yeah. so do you feel like maybe uh you are speaking from a position of privilege there <laughs> to be able to make that transition and that transition to be so easy for yeah. you no i understand with the question but no I, that's not the case and also i would i'll also respond to like maybe how practically people should go on this journey okay sure so at the time that i left because um uh, a lot of the money that I earned, either I spent, right? I'm not a great saver, to be honest, okay? Uh, so I, I did have a nice time in those years, all right? Either I, either I spent or, um, alhamdulillah, I was also able to, you know, uh, b uh, buy a house as well. Yeah. So, but that didn't mean that I didn't have, like, I had all the normal bills. So actually, I remember calculating um, that, okay, basically the money that I have right now, if I just look at the bills that I've got, yeah. right, my basic kind of bills that I require, like, I calculated that I had around three to six months of visibility. Okay. Yeah. So you'll be thinking, well, what did you do with all the money, right? But like, <laughs> I didn't get the million dollars. That that actually, you know, I didn't stay for that. So the point is, is that I had three to six months of visibility, okay. and I left for a voluntary position at an organisation called Mercy Mission, who said that they might be able to pay me in a few months' time. <laughs> yeah, depending on how Ramadan goes. Yeah, but that's basically what I was told. All right. So, um, so I was not in a like, whilst I had had the good fortune of uh, of of a short period of time of earning, et cetera, et cetera. And that facilitated certain things, no doubt. At the time when I made the decision, like in practice, that wasn't like, sure. you know, it was just the same old story, if you like, okay? okay? And to be honest with you, like this is the thing, you know, the truth is that for most people, vast majority of people, no amount is ever enough. <laughs> There's no amount that's ever enough. Like, yeah. you know, as you keep going, and I, I remember thinking about this carefully at the time, as you keep going through the, through the journey, like, you know, more stuff will rack up. And this is the point we end up making decisions, you know, we are basically constantly in fear. And there's a very famous and beautiful narration, I think it's narrated in uh, the collection of Ibn Majah, um, and to paraphrase, that, you know, wh whoever makes the dunya their main concern, Allah will confound their affairs and put poverty in front of their eyes, mm. and the uh, they will only in the end get from the dunya what was written for them in the first place. Mm. And look at those three things, okay? So their affairs will feel scattered. They won't feel as if they're in control of things. Uh, he will put poverty in front of their eyes, you know, in front of them. Mm. So this is a very powerful phraseology in the Arabic because what it basically means is it's, that it's not that you're poor or rich in truth, yeah. but you see poverty ahead. So even the very wealthy person can act in such a way out of fear of what will happen in the future. And so basically, you know, in that kind of self-preservating, um, preserving way or just, oh, and making that their only kind of decision-making uh, element, let's say. Yeah. 
So that's very important. Whereas the opposite, whoever makes the the akhirah, the life to come their main um, uh, their main priority, that Allah will settle their affairs, will give them contentment and tranquility, you know, in in uh, in themselves and um, uh, and the the dunya will run after them even if they're basically not interested. Okay, so and. And using that, and also uh, the you know the other verse around whoever is conscious of Allah, Allah makes from them a way out and exit. and provides for them for where they don't expect. Yeah. You know, I tell I tell people that in my personal experience, like I feel I have tasted what these verses and these narrations, like what it actually means. Because yeah. I remember, for example, calculating that when I left, that I would not be able to go on any fancy holidays or trips mm -hmm. anymore. You know, for example, like I could, these are the sacrifices I'm making. I'm just going to forget about these things. I'm not going to be able to do, like manage these things because I'm not going to be have a salary that's going to enable me to do some of those things. But you know, since then, over the last ten years or so, like I must have gone on like you know forty, fifty kind of trips to here, there, lo some lovely and amazing places around the world. The vast majority of which I haven't even had to pay for. You yeah. know, so it I comes. So Allah provides, and so. But to your point, in terms of that transition, so yeah. I would say to a person who is currently in a situation where they feel I'm stuck because I need the income for my bills and I don't see another way. Yeah. But the first thing is this, that's fine. And you, and you're, it's not to take away from, I have to emphasize this, it's not to take away from the fact that your work, um, you know, is worship, earning to pay the bills and to take care of yourself and your family, that there is a nobility in doing that. Yep. You know, I often think to myself, it's people, it's the people who are struggling in that way, and it's like month to month, let's say, week to week, month to month, yep. on the one hand, and perhaps people on the other end of the spectrum, they're almost kind of in a easier position in some w ways with regards to what we're talking about than the people who are in the middle. Right, okay. You know, more than they need, but not quite enough. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. And that's the kind of phase where it's like there's sure. no, nothing's ever enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're always calculating the next thing, the next thing, the next your mind, thing. Your, your mind is never settled. Yeah, yeah, your mind is not settled, but it's also like the intention. Yeah, yeah. Because now the intention has gone beyond mm -hmm. the essentials. Yeah. So you're in quite a dangerous fa uh, place, in my opinion, because then you start to realize that how much you're actually needing, like your definition of need changes all of a sudden, mm. you know? And so we 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 lack a sense of prioritization, you know, in 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 that sense. And it does become oftentimes then about the the career ladder, the title, yeah. the salary, you know, the salary, and just progressing in, mm -hmm. you know, keeping up with the Joneses, as they would say, yeah. right? Just just progressing in that worldly sense only. But I say to people, look, okay, you continue on whatever you're doing right now, and that's the thing. But do not allow your continuation of what you're doing right now to prevent you from the thought process that gets you to define and articulate what is the ideal, right? So that's number one. Like, okay. if you're saying, if someone isn't, not you yourself necessarily, but if someone is saying that what I'm doing right, like, I just don't even have the time to think about what I would otherwise do. Yeah. That That's a disaster. Like, clearly it's a disaster because, I mean, you're just, you're literally in the rat race. Yeah, 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 exactly. Literally in the rat That is literally just the definition of it. without living. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So at least, what is the ideal? Mm -hmm. Define that. And I literally tell people, if you haven't written it down, it's yeah. nothing. Yeah, yeah. because... It's just either random thought here, random thought there, but write it down. What is it? What is it? Now, typically what it will be the case if someone's serious and they're thinking about a combination of what aligns with what I love, what my skills are, mm -hmm. what the world needs, yeah. what Allah would want from me. Yeah. And we're combining all of these things. Okay. What someone will get down there when they go through the process and they will think about some value they can add. I believe that if someone really gets down clearly a proposition that is credible, that aligns, what does Allah want from me? What does the world need? What do I love? What am I good at? Yeah. What plays to my skills and my passions, my interests? They are creating value. Necessarily, that is a sustainable proposition, right? Because what is money? Money is an exchange of value. Yeah. So if someone has something valuable to offer, they will money will be an exchange for that, either because people are paying for something that you're offering directly or because yeah. people want to back what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, that is basically how it all works. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the question is, start with the question of instead of constraining yourself by being afraid that you're never going to be able to make this, that or the other, mm -hmm. get get passionate and get serious and get real about well, what is this thing that I can do to mm -hmm. offer value? The sustainability problem will solve itself. And then you just start to transition. And frankly, it's well known, even if you just look at in purely worldly or material senses, it's very common that people, for example, um, they're working, you know, normal jobs as an accountant, they're bored out of their head. 
and they have a business idea. Yeah. And then what? The side hustle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So what's your side hustle that mm -hmm. is like the godly side hustle, let's yeah. say, yeah? <laughs> the faith-driven, God-conscious side hustle uh, that that becomes something which is of value and something which inshallah will become over time sustainable if you want to transition to doing things in your life which you would do if you know like if you didn't need the money you still do those things because that's yeah. that's your starting point it's like i'm going to do the most valuable thing on earth that i can do in the short time that i have and then money's you know lower down the considerations yeah. so it's all in the end about the ordering of priorities and i believe that if you prioritize the key things first the material things will follow well we have gone on for quite long actually uh -huh. and we haven't even reached towards the end of the journey okay. so we're gonna have to go Fine. a little bit quicker now yes so from here you did that whole process of thinking and transitioning and you went over to national zakat foundation why nzf and uh what was that experience in nzf like uh and also did you bring skills from the corporate world yeah. into nzf yeah sure so initially as i said i joined uh, an organization called Mercy Mission. Mm -hmm. And Mercy Mission was, uh, in summary, like, and, and, and still is, a charity that was incubating a number of different projects. And that same year, it so happened that in 2011, uh, Mercy Mission had launched uh, a National Zakat Foundation in the United Kingdom in just before and during Ramadan in 2011. And I wasn't so much involved uh, in that particularly. Um, uh, I actually went, uh, ended up going abroad for a certain period for a Mercy Mission project and actually found my wife in Australia. Oh, and mashallah. Then, uh, <laughs> that's a, we definitely don't have time for that story <laughs> if you said we're limited on time. But now you're interested. So maybe part two, yeah? Uh, so anyway, the point being is that somewhere towards the end of 2011, so this is a couple of months after NZF is now. Do, do, quick question okay. on that. Do your kids have an Aussie accent a bit? Uh, no, no, no. They, are, they, are, they, have, they have a very English accent. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Carry on. Yeah. Um, as for my wife, uh, yeah. That's, that's, right. So anyway, so uh, yeah, so a couple of months after NZF... Um, uh, NZF launched, uh, basically there was a bit of a, a vacancy in terms of who's going to take this on now because, because as I said, it was one of a number of different projects at that time that was being managed by the same kind of team, let's say. Um, it didn't have someone giving it specific kind of mm -hmm. attention in that way. And what I'd initially started out doing for Mercy Mission ended up being not quite, you know, not quite right, etc. Uh, so remember, this is, a, this is also indicative of the fact that I hadn't got everything worked out beforehand, okay. right? You see, and that's important. I think something you've got to start, just start going on the journey once you've got yeah. a good idea and things will evolve as you go. Um, anyway, you said to summarize it, so let's summarize it. So by the end of 2011, I'm now project manager for NZF uh, as a project of Mercy Mission. Um, and we've now started this whole initiative of encouraging Muslims to give zakat locally because around us there are Muslims, there are believers who are eligible to receive zakat. Yeah. Um, and we had a number of different uh, things going on, a grant system that started and still is continuing today, obviously it's been developed further, uh, and various housing projects as well for homeless Muslim women, um, and later on a young, uh, young male prison leavers. Uh, it's a big problem, obviously, young Muslims in prison, especially young boys. Uh, and so, you know, trying to help them. Uh, 2013, you know, things grew. Alhamdulillah started getting traction. 2013 spun out into a separate charity, basically. Okay. So that was the Mercy Mission way, typically now, and it certainly has been since then, that starts a project, incubates, if you like, and then sort of spin off okay. Okay, a separate entity. And then over time, the teams, you know, evolve. So Alhamdulillah, quite a m mature uh, evolution and incubation evolution process. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, 2013 to 2000. 21, end of 2021, just a few months ago, um, was chief executive of a National Zakat Foundation through that time. And alhamdulillah, in that 10 years, you know, around 25 million pounds of zakat was collected and uh, distributed. Uh, you know, thousands of, uh, of you know, poor, struggling uh, Muslims, uh, families from around the country were supported everywhere from, you know, the top of Scotland to, you know, the bottom of the, the southeast and Wales and Northern Ireland and, you know, the whole work. So, you know the, the reach of it has been, um, you know, it's been it's been decent. It's been significant. I think it's like alhamdulillah, the the certainly NZF has put local zakat on the map, if you like. Yeah. But at the same time, still scratching the surface in terms of potential. Uh, and um, and yeah, the the idea was in summary, in one line, that we as believers need to realize that if we want to build a future for Islam in this society where we live, mm -hmm. we cannot keep sending all of our zakat elsewhere. If zakat's a pillar of Islam, that means that doesn't just mean oh, zak I have to do give my zakat, which is how we typically understand a pillar of Islam, an obligation that I have to do. No, it's a pillar of Islam. 
it upholds something called Islam. Right. And zakat upholds Islam by consequence of the way in which the money is utilized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now these are some of the really obvious but profound things that dawned upon me through my journey you know, of yeah. exploration. People don't realize that. People don't realize that the way in which we collectively utilize those funds, the future of Islam in part will depend on the intelligence, the strategy, the mm -hmm. thinking behind how that money is utilized. Yeah. And it's a collective resource, not an individual resource that we just, I, I choose where to do it, you choose where to, we all just randomly, depending on what color of the charity that appeals to us or this or that appeal, yeah. you know, just completely random, you know, to be honest, it's completely scattered random what happens with our zakat. And we're saying, look, we need to gather resources, invest in our people, our future here. That will make for a strong foundation amongst other things for the future of Islam and Muslims in this country. And that's the that was the the pitch then. It's still the pitch now. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the way in which that was done and is being done and, and will be done that naturally will evolve Change, with yeah. learning and the situation, and circumstance. So it's a challenging project, definitely, but it's something which I think is very important in terms of, um, let's say, improving the Muslim mindset yeah. with regards to understanding this particular pillar, and um, and, and taking things forward. Yeah. I remember I uh, came to a talk that you delivered at um, one of the masajid in okay. West London, actually, right. and uh, you were speaking about zakat and its its important place within mm. Islam, and also how it even links to some of the other pillars as well, especially mm. linking to salah. Mm. And I found it very, very interesting to mm. be honest, because oftentimes each pillar is spoken in its uh, in, in individually mm, yes. and it's not always spoken about how they line up with each other and why they are all yes. each pillars holding up islam like you yes. explained um and it made me kind of when when we met a couple of weeks ago yeah. to 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 speak more about transform my prayer which is what you're doing now yeah. uh it took me back to that memory where i thought did you have that natural transition between zakat and yeah. salah because of the way that you have already explained the uh, uh, partnership or uh, how, how zakat and salah relate to each other. Yeah. Was that something in your mind and uh, which is why you took that transition? Yeah, so a couple of things really. So one is that as I was continuing, and this is the thing, the questions which we spoke of earlier, which we should ask of ourselves in terms of, you know, what is valuable, what, what is the kind of work that I want to do, etc. Um, I continue always to ask myself those questions, you know, like, so even when I was at National Zakat Foundation and it seemed like, okay, this is a great thing in line with what, um, you know, I, I would want to do. I would always ask myself, like, is this the right thing? Is this the best thing for me, et cetera, et cetera. I found over the years that what I really enjoyed as part of, of uh, in that work was actually all the stuff to do with, like, the ideas, the thinking, like, well, what is Zakat? And, sure. you know, how, what's the best way to explain Zakat so that people really understand it? Um, and almost like from a strategic perspective, like the, all the, th the thinking process around what's the best way to utilize money, et cetera, et cetera. So the day-to-day -day kind of, let's say, operations, management, you know, the kind of elements of the CEO kind of role, which I was obviously uh, in, I mean, I think I, I hope I did at a reasonable level, but it wasn't necessarily that, you know, that was my passion. My passion was almost in the ideas and yeah. conveying the ideas. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, you're absolutely right. So it's a combination of uh, what I've just spoken about, but also the fact that then, if you were try, if you are interested as I am in what the future of Islam looks like and what my role is in trying to shape that, hopefully in a positive way, then you cannot have that discussion without having a discussion about the pillars. So I always felt, just like with zakat, that there's just like the conversation is really absent around like salah, zakat, like together and what these mean for us in the future. So I, I just felt that, look, okay, if I'm going to do justice to what I'm saying is my mission or my kind of um, ambition, then I can't be silent on this subject because there's pr zakat problems, but there's salah problems too. Right. And I, and I and as I said, you know, I felt that it was just, it's an underserved kind of a pillar. Mm -hmm. There's so many uh, believers who don't pray at all, who pray less than five times as they should, who don't pray with kind of focused concentration, etc. Mm -hmm. And so how do we contribute to a solution to that to that problem? And so in 2019, I started uh, developing um, and then for the first time taught the Transform My Prayer course. Okay. So that was in uh, the 1st of November 2019 was the very first class that I ran uh, in my local area of Sutton uh, in South London. Uh, and um, and yeah, so that was whilst that was NZF. So I was okay. kind of doing it on the side, yep. uh, the side hustle. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, and yeah, so that, that continued, uh, you know, ongoing. And then with the pandemic, then you obviously had to go online. 
uh, with COVID had to go online. There was more kind of um, uh, interest, more accessibility for people. And alhamdulillah, it was growing simultaneously. And then I just felt that, look, I'm, I'm really enjoying this kind of learning, education, conveying to people this thing. And I just felt that, you know, uh, it'd been like 10 years, obviously coming up to 10 years now. And it was 10 years in, in which I served as the, uh, the lead person at National Zakat Foundation. And I felt that that was a good good innings, as they say, <laughs> and that um, and I I I was always conscious actually about managing and being proactive in my own transition. Sure. So saying no, no, okay, I'm I'm going to leave now, and try to help the transition. Yeah. yeah. Try to help the process of the next person. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't this kind of person who was you know the kind of going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, either that or like hang on forever. Ah, okay. You yeah, know? yeah. Like yeah. I mean, there's both. Like historically, sure, sure, we sure. know that in our community. We, like just to hang on forever yeah. is a problem. That's that's uh, and infamous. obviously the, yeah yeah and obviously like and it's almost like the more modern corporate style which is like well basically I don't yeah. give a damn about what's going on here I'm, I'm yeah. off because it's about me. Yeah. So hopefully I try to balance that and Hamdal has got an excellent uh, chief executive now in uh, uh, Dr. Sohel Hanif who's really a scholar he's an academic yeah. he's a visionary mashallah and so someone maybe you should have here if you haven't already. Definitely. Um, so yeah so you know I think it's in good hands there's a great board of trustees at National Zakat Foundation as well so. I have a peace of mind that that's in, in order, uh, I hope, and obviously everything is in Allah's hands. And yeah, so my focus now is on really uh, just learning, researching, teaching and educating. And a lot of what I speak about actually is just the basics. I have this kind yeah. of back to basics kind of mm -hmm. um, uh, philosophy, if you want to put it that way, which is just to break down the simple things and represent them to people in such a way that people can really relate to. Yeah. And alhamdulillah, so I've been started doing that with the Salah and that's my main focus. But I also have started recently a Quran program called Club Revelation, which is about okay. introducing people to the key themes and messages in the Quran. Mm -hmm. uh, so it typically takes a thematic approach, like take a term or a phrase in the Quran that's repeated yep. and then look at the different contexts in which it's repeated and what does that tell us? So, okay. for example, I say to people, OK, so have you heard of Ulul Albab? Yeah. And everyone's like, Ulul Uluhu, Uluhu, right? <laughs> Ulul Albab, say so the people of insight. So Allah mentions the Ulul Albab, I think it's like 16 times or so, 14 or 16, I can't remember right now, it's 14 or 16 times in the Quran. So do we want to become people of insight? Well, what does he say about these people? He's clearly mentioned them, so clearly it's important. So yeah. what's going on there? Yeah. So let's figure that out. So that's mm -hmm. like it becomes a, a very interesting topic then, because mm -hmm. people, they don't know the term. Allah has talked about these people. So what about them? How do we become them, etc.? Okay. So and then many other examples like that. So that's the club revelation. And mm -hmm. the idea is that also people discuss with each other, reflect together. We don't okay. have that culture in our community. That we sit around, someone reads a passage, and then we just reflect together, share yeah. our reflections together. Yeah. Like we need that. I mean, that's, so this is this is kind of group work, basically. This yeah. kind of revelation. It's a combine. Well, it's a combination of like an introduction to a theme, okay, right, from myself, but then posing some kind of questions that maybe provoke thoughts and reflections. And I'm sticking. I have stuck with, and will for certainly for the for the foreseeable future, with all of the, if you like, the non-legal kind of verses. Let's say, yeah, you know, so things that, so the, some of the themes, you know, will be the remembrance of Allah, Dikrullah, Al Hayat al Dunya, the life of this world, Ulul Alba, people of insight, sun and the moon, mountains, etc. So just you know these kinds of things. Uh, I did one on diversity and difference, ikhtilaf in the Quran, and looking at that. Very no, it's very interesting because we say ikhtilaf, yeah. and immediately, like, as I'm sure this came to your mind, is about our oh, difference of opinion. Yeah. But Allah uses ikhtilaf in the Quran to reflect that, but in a different kind of sense than we typically understand it. Right. But also many other beautiful kind of verses. So anyway, so looking at all those kinds of things, so present a theme, provoke some questions, get people to discuss, breakout groups, etc. Okay, come back together. What, what, what have we come up with, etc. So it's not about obviously everyone becomes a scholar and a mufti, yeah. but we're doing what Allah tells us to do, which is mm -hmm. the double, which is reflect, but reflect together. And actually we need to do more and more of that. So so that's that. And then the, the final program, which I've effectively already introduced, you know, uh, without naming it so far, is called Last Day Leader. Mm -hmm. So the idea of Last Day Leader is a short program, six weeks, a couple of hours a week, to basically pay, take people through this reflective process, which we've discussed, yep. which is basically how do I live my life as if I'm truly conscious of the last day in this world, mm. which we don't know when it's going to be. So that provides us an urgency. And I'm conscious of the last day, you know, al yeah. al meaning next life, which is where I get my sense of focus because I know that's where my accountability comes. So I'm going to take responsibility now. And so that's about, you know, I start therefore the whole journey with getting people to think about how they're connecting to their Lord through salah, through prayer, and then bringing it 
you know, with further, hopefully, clarity through revelation, the guidance, and yeah. that opens people's eyes and perspectives, etc., deepens their perspective, which, of course, improves their prayer, but also helps with the next phase, which is that how am I using my time in between the prayers, yeah. basically? Yeah. And I suppose in one way, one, the verse that comes to mind is, you know, which I'm trying to, I suppose, think about uh, for myself and help others to think about is, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ uh, say indeed my prayer, my sacrifice, my living and my dying are all for Allah, Lord of all that exists. It's very interesting, you know, one of the ways to reflect on the Qur'an is to think about, like, well, if that term wasn't there, or this part of the phrase wasn't there, what would have, what would we miss? Yeah. It's very, very important. In fact, when you analyze Salat and Zakah in that way, you'll realize that there's so many places where salat, the mention of Salat and Zakah, if it was omitted, we wouldn't have noticed mm. the difference almost. It almost seems to be just extra. But the fact that it's there then means that, okay, there's a sure. real reason for that. So similarly here, why didn't Allah simply say, قُلْ إِنَّ مَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say my living and my dying all for God, Lord of all that exists. Because that basically covers everything. Yeah. But actually we notice it starts with what? Salah. Mm. So the, it really is a cornerstone. If you want to get to the stage where you're living and dying, everything is for Allah, start mm. with the prayer. But then of course it evolves, right? And then we can think about, okay, how do we make the entirety of the direction of our lives? Yeah. One direction, yeah, mm. not to quote the boy band, right? <laughs> but literally make it one direction. You know, that everything is going in the same direction in yeah. our lives. Yeah. Um, and it's when all the small things align yeah. in intention uh, and in strategy, if you like. Yeah. Literally everything from family life to interaction, you know, parents, spouse, uh, children, uh, neighbors, your interaction with community, mm -hmm. what you're doing in society, what your quote unquote job is, because yeah. obviously I don't really think about it in that way. It's just life, it's just one life. Just do your life. And should all be coherent and all be in one, in one uh, sort of direction with one end goal, which is, of course, ultimately to, uh, to, to, which is Allah. Allah is the end, you know, the end goal of all of it. And so, yeah, so, so that's the idea. And I think it's through, quite, yeah. quite fascinating that you have brought those three elements together in your um, online education that you do now. Um, and if people want to try and understand uh, the things you said, so you said, uh, transform my prayer, salah. Mm -hmm. Club Revelation Quran, last day leader in terms of leadership yep. and um, your 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 position in this world. Uh, it's all on iqbalnasim.com, I believe. That's right. Um, and uh, I mean, what, what I was saying is that my reflection on those three is that you've brought them all together, and it seems a quite a holistic package because mm. your salah is your direction and your connection to Allah. Mm. The revelation is coming to you and telling you what you need and mm. feeding yourself. And last day leaders about the people that are around you and exactly. the creation and showing them their rights um, yeah. and, and, and being part of, of this life and what do you leave behind here as well. Yeah. Uh, so it becomes quite um, a holistic I, I couldn't package. have summarized it better myself. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and was that, was that the vision behind it that you're going to try and cover these three cornerstones of the believer's life in order to leave behind that at least you yourself as Iqbal Nassim who has gone through this journey that we've uh, discussed of that you started off with your Al-Nur news uh, letter <laughs> and that was your physical mailing list now you've got a, a electronic mailing list and uh, you know the two, the two ends of your life uh, still seem like they're all uh, directing towards you trying to do the best you can with the resources that you have was that the intention behind you now taking this journey on? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, you know, uh, Allah khair, may Allah uh, reward you uh, for summarizing succinctly <laughs> the. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's um, what it is, really. I think that's what it is. I mean, you know, yeah. As I think about it now, like the, yeah, that the coherence of those, you know, those things, if you like, I think it's a strong. Um, there's just strong linkages between them. It refers to the, you know, the basics. You know, yeah. introduce to people to the basics, and I think towards the end of the journey, it's about saying, you know what. You're a lot more. You're a lot more capable of doing things than you think you are. Most people completely underestimate themselves, mm. and actually, true believers, like their ambition, if you like, to do the absolute best and to be the best, you know, is high. Because if we truly believe in our Lord, we truly believe in the, in possibility, in potential, um, and we explore ourselves fully, if you like, and we become, you know, really who we are called to be. So that is the idea. Um, and that's my, you know, and that's my hope that for myself in my own journey, because I'm obviously going through my own journey, all of this process, as well as for others, that whole, you know, these openings can be facilitated where people live and lead truly God-centered lives. That's what I say. My mission is to help people lead truly God-centered yeah. lives and that we can all serve, you know, uh, our Lord's cause in, the, in this world. Um, journey on the path, facilitate the path and have that prophetic empathy um, concern for all human beings 
and for all human beings to find the truth and find peace and find tranquility you know in this life and the next may Allah make it so and uh, we ask Allah that he blesses you and uh, gives you the tawfiq to carry carry this work on mm -hmm. and definitely uh, rewards you your mother especially mm -hmm. for the amount of impact that she's had so Jazakallah mm -hmm. khair for joining me Iqbal it's been very inspirational thank you thank you very much so if you guys really enjoyed this then please make sure you go ahead and you share this around to friends and family don't forget that you can find this on our website and our app and uh, We'll see you in the next one, really. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.